All right, tonight we're going to talk about uh, ways to prepare for winter and things you can do during winter. So the most often, the thing that comes up the most often preparing for winter is feeding. Now I am very much against doing anything arbitrarily. You should always have a reason for doing everything. So feeding bees is not like feeding rabbits, right? They're not stuck in a cage. They're not in a fence. Like their whole job is to go out and get the stuff and bring it back here. And then we take some of it from them. Hopefully we leave them enough so that they can survive on their own. That is our purpose in beekeeping. Um, so you'll see a lot of people using various types of feeders and some people think that they have to feed all the time, all year long. Uh, that, that introduces a couple of problems. Number one, it's not good nutrition. Sugar is not the best diet for bees. Honey is. Not nectar. They need to convert the nectar to honey before they can properly um, eat it. Secondly, you're going to cause problems where you uh, bring too much nectar into the hive and the bees can't properly deal with it and so what happens is they backfill the brood nest with nectar that they're trying to process into honey and squeeze out the area that the queen needs to lay eggs and raise brood. And so that's going to limit the amount of brood that your hive can get limit the amount of brood that is going to be for the next generation of bees that are the next generation of workers because you always remember that those workers take three weeks to make and they live for six weeks so there has to be a constant turnover of brood all the time this generation will be the bees of, of next month and and so on you always have to have that process continually working and if you cut that off um, which various things that we do can can cut that off. We don't want to do those things as much as possible. But if you cut that off, you can cause your hive to be handicapped later on. Another issue with feeding um, most times of the year, except when it's cold, is robbing. Um, for some reason, sugar water is very popular with bees. And if you have a feeder, especially the Boardman feeders, the ones that you'll see that are a little jar that sits right here, they're convenient because you can use a quart jar and they're really cheap and they, they're easy to get to, but they are the easiest possible way for, um, for uh, another hive to try and come in and steal because all they have to do is just go right in. I mean, there's, there's, even, if you, even if you limit the entrance size, there's still a very short path to get to the food. Uh, another option is what's called a miller feeder which sits on the top and if you're not paying close attention it will look like a box about like that usually a little shorter and that will hold several gallons of syrup and that's a little better for feeding syrup before I go along I don't recommend feeding syrup at all I'm just kinda yeah. explaining what people do um, that's better because the bees have to go further if they're going to rob, but still the smell can cause robbing. Um, another option is one called a frame feeder. And that is one, it's a plastic container that's about the shape of the frame. It sits in here and you'll see any commercial feeding video that you can find on YouTube. You'll see the guys, they'll pop the lid, they'll pull out this big spigot and they'll fill that up with, with uh, sugar water. or in the commercials case, they'll fill it up with high fructose corn syrup, which is even worse for nutrition wise. Yeah. Um, that's a good feeder. I mean, so far as they're used, again, I don't recommend using them at all. I sold all of mine that I had. So the only reason that I feed is in, again, not, never do anything arbitrarily. The only reason I feed is because I, look at a hive and I can see that they don't have enough honey to survive the winter. That's the only reason I ever feed. And so right now is the time you want to do that when it's cold because the bees will be clustered. They will have begun, they'll, they'll, they'll have moved into their final clustering location for the winter and they will be hopefully at the bottom of the stores in a, in a vertical hive. They'll be at the bottom 
of the stores and they'll beginning, be beginning to work their way up. So what I will do is I will open the lid a little bit on a cold day so that they're not flying because I don't want to smoke them or disturb them or anything at this time. And I'll just slide the lid back and sometimes I have a flashlight or if the sun's at the right angle that'll work. And I'll shine the flashlight down or use my cell phone. That's always useful. Shine the flashlight down and I will be able to see capped honey from the tops of the frames. I will also be able to see where the bees are. So if the bees are way down there, see this box, this is, this is three deeps or something taller. And I can see there's capped honey up here and I can't really see the bees down there because they're at least the next box down. And if the frames aren't lined up, you can't see that far down. So if I see them down there, I will just assume that I don't need to feed them at all. There's nothing, there's plenty of honey, they're doing great, they're in the right spot, there's no concern. However, this year I do, I've done a lot of splitting and most of my hives are single deeps or a deep and a medium, so they're not very big. So I will come in and do the same thing. I will look down, I will be able to see the cluster because you know there's only one, maybe two boxes to work with. And I can see that the cluster is halfway up, halfway up the frame here. So the, the cluster is like in this area. So I can see there's still capped honey here maybe, or in a very bad situation, there's no capped honey at all and they're on, on the verge of starving to death. So in that case, I will decide that I need to feed. Now, normally in a normal situation where I have all the bees that I want, uh, in the past that has been in the range of 24 hives or something, so I would go into winter with preferably more than 24, say 27 or 30, because I want to end up with 24. And so I might look at my 27 or 30 hives and decide that half a dozen of them are low, but the rest are fine. And in that case, I would just let it ride. I would not worry about doing anything because I need to eliminate those that haven't, that obviously haven't performed well enough this year to have saved up enough honey. Uh, maybe they had uh, a mild disease problem or something that kept them from, from working at full performance. So I'm just going to let them go. And a lot of times they'll survive anyway, which is good for us. Anything that survives on its own is good for us. So when I've decided that I'm going to feed, and I'll talk a little bit here in a minute about top bar hives and stuff too. Um, what I will do, and I forgot my paper towels. Anyway, this is for later. So I will take a layer of paper towels and I will lay them down. Uh, the ones with the, the shorter perforations, like uh, the, what are they used to call them? They're all, yeah, the half sheets. Those are really good because three half sheets almost perfectly covers one normal length of a box. And so I'll lay down three half sheets, or I might do them double wide if I want to stack some more in here. Lay them down, I'll put a box on, or I might put a box on first if there's any wind and I don't want the paper towel to blow away. And put a box on, and then I'll take my bag of bulk sugar and just pour a pile in there. Now if you do this too early in the year when the bees are still flying, you're going to need to wet down the sugar or else the bees will haul the sugar out because they don't really want it. It's basically, in that, in that form it's more or less sand. So they will, they will literally haul it all out. And then they will chew up the paper towels and they will haul that out too. And you'll have, you'll have piles of sugar on the front of your hive and bits of shredded paper towel too. So if you do it too early in the year, you will have to either, you know, drip a little bit of water on it, spray it down with a squirt bottle, something to make it wet and will, so that it will solidify and they won't be able to carry it out. Because when they're actually going to be using it is when they've completely run out of everything else. They really, it's not their favorite thing to use. Uh, they will, if you can have piles of sugar sitting out in the yard, they will not touch it whatsoever. They don't want it. It's not what they need. Um, so, 
I like to wait until now in the year after it started raining, so it's kind of moist because it will it will absorb it it will absorb water as well and will harden on its own. And you saw the little bucket of sugar that she got there. Um, and some other benefits that are that are good of it, good with it, is that it will never cause robbing because again the other bees don't want it. Um, if you're concerned about adulterating your honey with sugar, you have nothing to worry about when you're using sugar because they only use it after they run out of honey or when they're close to running out of honey. Uh, it also gives you the chance to keep, um, notice where your cluster is, make sure your cluster's in the right spot because when this is sitting on top of here, the bees are gonna move up toward it and they will only go after it when the cluster is touching the sugar. So that also introduces another concern. If you've got empty boxes up here, say you added a super late in the season thinking that they would fill it and they didn't, then what you need to do is either take that box off and keep it somewhere else or put that box back on top of this one. The pile of sugar should be in contact with the frames where the honey is. You don't want uh, bees will be very hesitant to move across empty comb to get to anything. So it's very important in winter time. Around here it's not quite as bad because our, uh, our weather is not generally cold enough to keep them from moving around on the comb. When you get back in places like when I was living back east when the temperature could get down to below 20 degrees for a week on end or something and the bees are totally unable to break cluster and move to new stores especially when they have brood if they've started rearing brood too early they will not be able to break cluster and move up onto those stores and they will starve to death just inches I have always called it cold starvation they will starve to death just inches from the honey and it's really sad to see that. You'll find that a lot of times on bees that come from a warmer climate. So when I lived in Arkansas, I had bees that, uh, I bought bees in maybe 2009 that came from Georgia. And they did great. The whole year, you know, I bought them in the spring. They were, they were nucleus, five frame nuke hives. Uh, they built up into three deeps. They were outstanding performers. But the first cold came along and they just died. They couldn't break cluster to get to those stores and so they died. So they died with, you know, a box and a half of honey on top of them. It's a really crying shame. And what could you have done to help them? Anything? Um, in that case, there's, there's nothing that you can do short of heating the hive or something. I mean, that's one of those yeah. things that they just need to be able to do on their own. Uh -huh. Um, and again, that's, you have to, to really be a good treatment free beekeeper, you have to adjust your frame of mind so that you need to treat trials and tribulations as tools, mm -hmm. as a way to sift the weak from the strong. Mm -hmm. So, and when we, when we talk about um, getting new bees, then if you don't have to pay for your bees, which is I've, I've gone from um, recommending packages to only recommending nukes to now I don't recommend that you buy bees at all. Mm -hmm. Catch bees from your own local swarms. Spend the money that you would have spent, you know, what's a package of bees cost now? 150 bucks. So, yeah. a, a nuke costs 200, even more mm -hmm. some places. Take that money that you would have spent, go down and buy yourself a couple of boxes, um, and even better, go buy some used boxes because because bees like that more. And invest in swarm traps and catch bees for free rather than buying bees because um, you're going to get bees inevitably. I mean, unless around here, unless you buy some from Applegate Apiaries, which is a treating operation, or from Old Saw Apiaries, which is a treating operation, you're not going to be able to get local bees. Mm. It's just not available. So they will either come from 
around here, they'll come from California. If you're in other places in the country, they'll come from Texas or Georgia or Alabama or places that are not where you are. And I'm talking to people on the internet as well. Don't buy bees. Go with, go with what's local to you and what's cheapest and free because if you do really well and say you catch five swarms in a year and then just off chance they all die that winter, what did that cost you? It didn't cost you hardly anything and you can just go and catch some more the next year. Mm -hmm. It totally changes your frame of mind. You're not stuck on, I have to keep these bees alive because these are the only bees that I have and they cost me $200. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do that anymore. It's so much easier mentally when you're not having to worry about the cost and all the, the, the investment that you've put into raising the bees and keeping them alive and feeding them and doing all the other stuff because everything is reusable. Um, did I miss anything on feeding? Does anybody have any questions? I do have one question and it was just something that had happened that I asked you already and that was I have a deep and then a medium that's packed with honey and then another medium that has only half the amount of half the frames of honey and the other half are empty. Like some people say take that whole super, I mean take that whole super off and then just give them those frames of honey later rather than leave one on and a non-full super on top. Would there be any reason? Is it like for cold reasons or I don't know? I don't, I'm not really concerned with empty boxes. I will, because I'm a person that puts my empty frames, empty comb back on the hive when I'm done extracting. So there will be oh. even a couple of em totally empty boxes oh. sitting up here of just comb. Okay. And I do that because, well, number one, there's no beekeeper in, in nature to come take the, the comb off and store it and put yeah. put uh, put mothballs on it so the moths don't eat it. It stays in the hive where the bees can take care of it, and so that's what I try to do. Uh, uh -huh. The mothballs are the the big thing because that's that's one of those things that has become part of beekeeping canon. Is you have to take after you've extracted pile your boxes up here and either, you know, keep them somewhere where they shine light so that the moths don't get them yeah. or put moth crystals, paradichlorobenzene or whatever it's called, uh, paramoth crystals on it. I say just forget all of that. Just go put it back on the hive. I've done it for years. The, so the bees don't Good. seem to mind Good. having that extra space and they seem to be able to take care, better care of the moths yeah. than other options. Okay. Um, if it were me, I would, are those, those frames, are they on one side? Are they in the middle? Uh, or are they I just mixed? I put them all in the middle. I would say that's fine. Yeah. Because then if you, if later in the winter you discover that they're running out of stores, that they've used up all that honey below, yeah. um, you can do the sugar thing on top. And this is called, uh, this is often goes by the name of mountain camp feeding. It's, I think, the, um, the, the legend of it is that there's a guy on Bee Source who went by the name Mountain Camp who was really a huge advocate of this system, and so that's how it got that name. I just say feed granulated sugar. Um, okay, thanks for Other types of hives. So if you use types of hives like a a uh, ware hive, which has separated frames like the Langstroth does, so that the bees can get up through. You can do the same type of system. Now, if you've got uh, hives like the top bar hive or the Layens hive, which have full width top bars, so there's no gap on top, you're going to have to figure out something else to do. Uh, I've heard of. Put it right down on the floor. Yeah, Michael Bush has has done it where he would take. Um, empty comb off the end or, or maybe bars that hadn't been built on and just put a pile of sugar right in there and make sure it's up against the honey because you, bees won't cross empty comb to get to other things and that's an important thing when you're going into winter with your top bar hive as well 
usually there's honey on one end. Usually, yes. And that's important because like vertically, they won't, if a, if a, if a cluster starts in the middle somewhere, it'll go up and it will consume the stores going up. It will not go, it will not, when it runs out, then go back down to the bottom and, and make sure it's got everything. It won't happen. The same thing with a, with a uh, top bar hive. If the cluster for some reason starts in the middle and during the winter it goes to one end where the, where the honey is, it will not then go back to, to pick up stuff that it left over here. So in that case, what you want to do, which it's not normal. Normally they have, normally the stores will be on one end, but sometimes they will they, be on one end. Normally they will yeah. be, but sometimes they'll be in the middle somewhere. And in that case, you That's want to, right. Yeah. You want to reorganize things so that the bees are always at one end starting and then all the stores are in the same direction through the rest of the hive. And that can be either direction depending on how your hive is set up and how the, how the bees have filled it. But they will not go back and pick up stuff that they've left behind. And that's very important because you, if you didn't know that fact, you might think that everything was okay because, oh, they're almost out of honey here, but oh look, there's a whole, more, you know, there's a whole bunch more over here. And that's just not gonna work. In a lands hive, I don't know how you do this. I don't even know what that is. I'm trying to get into land's hive. We'll see what happens. A land's hive is, it's built with, it's like about that long and it's much taller. It uses much taller frames and it's one single box. It's kind of like a, a hybrid between a horizontal Langstroth hive and a top bar hive. Oh. So uh, I did an interview with a guy, Dr. Leo Shirashkin is his name. Oh, right on the podcast and talked all about that. So you can go to his website and check out those hives. They're very interesting. They're made with two by dimensional lumber and they're big and they're, anyway, they're fun. So that is feeding. The other thing with, um, if you, if you come along later in the winter, say February or something, and the bees have mostly eaten off of, eaten all that, that sugar, or maybe they've eaten it all, and there's a cluster right here on top of the frames and they're, they're starving to death or they're near to starving to death, you can just lay down another paper towel and pile some more sugar on there. If you get to the end of the year, the end of the winter, and there's extra left over when you come around to um, split hives or, or do your uh, supering or whatever, and there's chunks of honey, you know, a lot of times they'll eat out of the middle and there'll be chunks in the corner that they haven't got to. You can just take those chunks, they're pretty hard, dump them in a bucket or in your sugar sack or whatever, and then reuse them next year. They're not gonna go bad, it's just a chunk of sugar. Um, so that is feeding sugar. There's another thing, preparing for winter I forgot to mention. Uh, a lot of people use entrance reducers. So what that is, is if you wanna buy them, they have little slots. It's like a, a three-quarter inch square board that you can stick in there. And you can do that. You can you can jam a couple of pieces of bark rocks. in there. Rocks. <laughs> uh, old. I found when I was up at my yard the other week, there's a chunk of a pallet. And I just kind of shoved it in there so it was blocking off part of the entrance. Um, I haven't seen too many problems with mice around here, but I had a huge problem with them in Colorado. And so a lot of people in different places use uh, mice guards, which are basically a piece of metal, an L-shaped piece of metal with perforations in it that the bees can get through, but mice can't. Those are useful if you have mice problems. Although if you have your entrance way reduced, they're not gonna get in. Mice can squeeze through an amazingly small oh. space. Uh -huh. That's true. Mice can go, um, cats I've discovered can too. We have a, we have a feral cat <laughs> no cats in our, in our uh, crawl space right now who crawls up out of a space that big wow. between the, the furnace and the wall. The cat yeah. fits up in a space that big. God, raccoons are like that too. Mice can fit under something as small as a quarter of an inch and something as narrow as half an inch depending on if they can whistle the way through and the size of the mouse. So, um, because I had all that problem with the um, 
the yellow jackets, I completely blocked my bottom entrance. And there, there's a little hole in my top super, like this. Mm -hmm. And they're, I'm, they're using that. So you're, they're basically using an upper entrance. Um, that shouldn't matter in the winter. No, actually, in winters, I think upper entrances are better yeah, because right. they allow they allow the moisture to rise with the, the, the cluster. And actually, it's kind of counterintuitive, but I've done the math. Uh, moist air is, is lighter than uh, dry air. So moist air, even though it seems like it would be heavier because it's carrying water, it actually rises. And so in your typical hive that's set up like this one with the entrance on the bottom and the lid on the top, which is helpful because it allows you to work on the top of the hive without disturbing the bees coming and going. And it also uh, uh, usually causes the brood nest to be in the bottom and the honey in the top, which is helpful for, for working your hive. Um, a top entrance, when, when it's set up like this, that, that moist air will rise and it will either condense on the lid, on the underside of the lid, and if, you're, if your hive is level, which it should be, um, and you might have a, a low spot right there, it will condense and drip back down onto the comb and onto the bees, and that can kill the bees, which is no good. You can eliminate that by having a more insulating cover, like using a sheet of foam board insulation rather than a sh just wood. Like this is, this is not a very good cover for avoiding water. This is too thin to allow much insulation, insulating capacity. And so I like to use, this would be under a, uh, some sort of exterior cover that, that is more waterproof. But my- oh, like, like the metal roofing yeah. things they make. Yeah. And so a good roof would be a sheet of insulation or um, a lot of people use uh, the, the standard inner cover, which is, uh, um, a one by frame with a piece of masonite in the middle. And that tends to, because the, the masonite is very thin and it also has a hole in the middle, water doesn't usually condense on that because the, the temperature is equalized from both sides of it. However, if your top cover, your telescoping cover or whatever you're using, does have a dish or something problem in there, you can still have that water drip back down. What about a real thick piece of wood? A thick, the thicker piece of wood would be good too. Because mm -hmm. you just need a little bit of, of insulating factor so that um, so that water doesn't, I don't, I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with, with how condensation and stuff works. But as the temperature drops, water or the air is able to hold less water. And so what you want to avoid is having the temperature drop below the dew point on that surface of the, of the lid. Mm. So if you, can, if you can get a piece of insulation so that the dew point doesn't happen in there, uh, you can avoid that. So n the best way that it would work is the, the air comes up to the top, it then cycles over the, the top bars and then falls back down the sides. And in the summer, that's how the bees will often ventilate. And these hives are built with a little extra space on the side here that allows for that. But they're able to do it by themselves, even if they, even if we don't design a hive for it. One, one more question about the top entrance. Maybe it was because my bees weren't used to it, but I gave them that top entrance to use. And I, Michael Bush says that they'll actually haul even dead bees up out of that top entrance. My whole bottom entrance was clogged with dead bees. So I cleaned them out, but aren't they supposed to bring them up through that top entrance? It really depends on the, type, the time of year and the attitude that they are in toward cleaning because it's not all the same year round. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people believe that the the three quarter inch entrance on the bottom is for extra ventilation on a on a standard bottom which has so a standard bottom has um, a frame around the edge and then a flat piece of wood and the frame is taller on one side than the other on one side it'll be three quarters of an inch and the other side it'll be three eighths 
A lot of people mistakenly believe that the three quarters of an inch is for the summertime so that you have more ventilation and the three eighths of an inch is for winter time so you have less ventilation. People rarely ever turn them over anyway. Everybody always just uses the three quarter inch. Yeah. But the real, the real original reason why it was built that way is so that in the winter time you would have more room for dead bees to pile up in the bottom of the hive. The bees aren't really interested in cleaning out the hive detritus all year long. They, oh. they will do the most cleaning probably in the spring. Oh, okay. So, well, should I leave You can leave them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they're hurting anything. Yeah. Uh, in fact, a lot, you see a lot of people now experimenting with open bottom hives and hives with dirt, like a tray of dirt or soil. Yeah. Uh -huh. or wood chips or all sorts of fun eco stuff floor. yeah eco floors which again I mean that's fun to play with if you want to try that I don't feel the need to build a bunch of extra equipment to <laughs> put on all my hives right now so I'm not yeah. doing that um, so yeah an upper entrance is just fine you can do that all year long I've done upper entrances before they really help with skunk problems because skunks can get to bottom entrances and they eat the bees and it causes the hives to get weak. If the entrance is at the top, the, high, the skunk typically can't reach up there and so it's not a problem. Well, what about screen bottoms and solid bottoms? I don't do screen bottoms for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, if they work, then they are doing something that the bees should be doing themselves, namely taking care of mites on their own. Mm -hmm. Number two, they don't work, and the the people reporting in their hive losses and, and things from the Bee Informed National Survey, which you should take part of part in, and you can get the information from. I think it's like beeinformed.org. Really good information if you're looking for to figure out whether or not different practices have an effect on, um, I the only outcome I really look for is survival. Yeah. So when I look at screen bottom boards and there is no statistical difference between people in the survival rates of hives between people who use screen bottom boards and the ones who don't, then there's no reason to use them. Yeah. Because they just don't do anything. What don't. Do they even put? Um, they were originally invented as a way for mites to fall out of the hive. And then people started using them for more ventilation. Mm -hmm. And that's the third reason why I don't use them is because uh, they cause too much ventilation. So when you have this huge hole in the bottom of the hive, then if the bees can't control the ventilation, they will move away from it. And so what you'll have happen is the bees will no longer use the bottom if, if, it's, if it's not too bad, they'll maybe only use like the bottom or the top half of the frames. If it's really bad, you know, if you have wind blowing up in there, <laughs> they will not use the bottom box at all. So instead of that whole wooden piece, they just, there's just a screen? Yes, there'd be a frame, a frame around the bottom mm -hmm. with, a, with a, well, there'd be a hole. Mm -hmm. Different people make them different ways, but yeah. But it's all screen. Mm -hmm. Screen, yes. So that's why I don't use those. What else do we have? Any more questions on wintering? Okay, well then let's move on to something else that you should be doing this time of year. Say that you've, you've got your bees all buttoned down for winter and you should be preparing to catch swarms for the next year. Now, the most important thing for catching swarms is the right box. Now, this isn't, I'm not talking about catching, going out and, and shaking swarmed, you know, a cluster of bees that's on a tree. That's a whole different subject. These are swarm traps. So the idea behind these is you have swarm traps set up every mile or two, however many you want, and you're gonna catch those swarms and they're just gonna move into the hive and then you're gonna take the hive wherever to your bee yard and you're gonna have a new hive. So that means you don't have to worry about having bee equipment in your car all the time and getting calls in the middle of your day while you're working or doing something else. You go, oh, I gotta go catch a swarm. I can't, I gotta stay, you know, I've got work to do. These just catch them for you. 
like I was talking about earlier, it's a much better investment in my view to invest in swarm traps because say I spend, say I go all out and I, and I buy everything and I come up with this great swarm trap and I spend $50 on this swarm trap. For the same price I could spend on a package of bees, I could build three swarm traps and those swarm traps would continue to serve as swarm traps for 20, 40 years, who knows. Mm -hmm. So they're going to catch that equivalent of, of uh, package bees over and over and over again. You get free bees over and over and over again. And chances are those bees are going to be very healthy. They're going to be local. They're going to perform much better than a package because they're a natural condition. They are going to grow better. And hopefully they'll survive better. Now, if they come from a treated hive, there's a less chance of them surviving better, but they're free bees, so it's not that much of a big deal. So, we all know the benefits of catching swarms, namely free bees. How do we catch them? Well, there are a couple of factors, and these factors are somewhat additive. Okay, so if you have one factor, you're going to be doing okay. If you have two, three, four, of these factors added together, your chances of catching a swarm in each box are going to be better. Now, number one thing to remember is it is fishing, right? If there's no fish, you're not going to catch fish. If you use bad bait, you're not going to catch fish. You might still catch some fish anyway on accident, but the better bait you have, and if you're fishing in the right hole, you're going to get more fish. So the same goes with swarms. So first we're going to start with a bottom board. Um, one way you can do this if you're, I've brought this box specifically because it has a corner rotted out. So that provides a perfect entrance. I don't have to put an entrance anywhere else. But if you don't have an entrance in your box, you can drill one in the bottom. And that will that will keep water from getting in it. If water does get in it, it'll drain out. Now out here, water's not a huge issue. It doesn't rain much in the summer. It doesn't rain at all in the summer here, so don't have to worry about that. But if you put a hole in the top, if it does rain, you're gonna get water in your box. So next thing you're gonna have is your box. Now here I've used a single deep. Now here's where one of your factors comes in. The number one, probably most important factor is the size of the box. Now bees like a cavity of about 50 liters. You can do the math on exactly how big that is. But if you've got single deeps laying around, it's a really good option. It's right about the right size. Um, when I was in Arkansas, the swarms were fairly small and I could catch a lot of swarms in five frame nukes, which are, you know, 25 liters or however many there. are. Here, I caught, I had plenty of swarm traps out this year of five frame nukes and didn't catch a single one. So they don't like them here. They're, the swarms seem to be bigger. Um, the ones that I, the five swarms that I did catch were in either single deeps or stacks of boxes, bigger hives, right? I caught, I caught one that was in a stack of five boxes. But that was a very large swarm and that would be unlikely to catch normally. It actually, the swarm itself filled three boxes. It was a huge swarm. So if you are not a fan of 10 frame deeps, say if you like eight frame mediums, the equivalent of eight frame mediums would be about two eight frame mediums. You can also go as small as one eight frame deep. In fact, uh, they're one of the guys who wrote a book on the subject recommends eight frame deeps. So you're saying between like an eight frame medium and a 10 frame deep, deep? Is that what you said? Or an eight frame deep? And a you want bigger than an eight frame medium. You want two eight frame mediums. Eight frame. So the minimum size would be approximately an eight frame, an eight frame deep. I and the see. maximum size would be two 10 frame mediums. You would actually set out two boxes? If you wanted to, yeah. Or the size of two boxes. Or you're just saying if you had that equipment around. Right. You just want a yeah. how Whatever equipment you use. Like I'm in, in the process of sort of switching to 10 frame mediums. So I would use two 10 frame mediums and I would like 
strap it together something so oh, it stay together or what screw if, it together. What if you don't say have any equipment or like we're going to go top bar hives, what would you... So for top that? bar hives... You're, well, I just mean for catching snark. Yeah. For if you want to if you want to do a top bar hive, um, you could either use an empty box, or you could use an empty box with top bars in it. Well, no, no, that's not what I mean. It's easy to to put any you put any swarm in a top bar hive, but I mean for catching. Say I don't have a bunch of equipment around. What you size? Yeah, like what would you what would be the ideal? Like two feet, three feet. It all goes back to the volume. Now you're going to take yeah. your your cross section of your hive, your your top bar hive, and there, there are various different sizes, and you're going to figure out the length that you need to come up with approximately 50 liters. Right. Okay. And you're saying basically a 10 frame deep is about that. Right. That's what I thought. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So anything from an eight frame deep up to two 10 frame mediums. That okay. range is a good range. And you can do it with empty boxes. Uh, you can do it with like wine boxes. Right. You can do it with old fruit crates. Yeah. Really just any, any box of the right size dimension mm -hmm. is a good idea. You will find in the beekeeping um, stores, in the online and other places, you'll find these sort of um, like reconstituted cardboard. They're almost like pots that they're upside down and use those for, don't use those because they don't last. Mm -hmm. If they get rain on them, they're oh, ruined. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you can't, they squish too easily, they tie up, and then if you do catch a swarm in it, you have to cut out the swarm and put it in something else. Mm -hmm. So just go with something use your hive type and use something that already exists in your hive type so that you make the transition from the catch box to the new hive as seamless as possible. In this case, if I catch a swarm in this box, I take this box, I set it out in the yard, I stack another box on it. It becomes a hive instantly. I don't have to do anything with it. So what were you going to say about a top bar hive for a swarm trap? If you were to build a smaller top bar hive, or you could use, uh, if you have a spare top bar hive sitting around, you might divide it in half right. and put swarm lure in it. Mm -hmm. um, basically any box that's available. Basically just the top bar hive. Right. <laughs> yeah. you, could, you, could, you could leave it out there and there's a, there's a decent chance you'd get your swarm in it as it is. Really? Now, just put your empty hives out and mm -hmm. they might just move in? When I, two of, the, two of the swarms that I caught this year were just in stacks of boxes sitting, empty boxes sitting out in the yard mm -hmm. with comb in them. Uh -huh. So that worked really well for me this year. So let's add another factor. I wanted to, another factor that we can use to catch bees is I wanted to have, this has had comb in it. This is a, a foundationless frame. You want used comb? You want used comb. You yeah. want like one frame of used comb if you can get it. So if I like froze some from last year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you could take an empty one out of a hive in the spring yeah. that they haven't filled sure. up yet. Mm -hmm. uh, a top bar with comb on it. Anything, the darker the better. Old used comb is really good. Mm -hmm. So you want at least one frame in there and that will add to your chances of catching. That's the hard part when you're just starting out. Yes. Like where are you going to get them from? So we get as many of the factors as we can. So the next factor would be a used box. So this box would make a really good swarm trap because it's been used. It's 13 years old. It's got a hole out of the corner. Uh, it's smell. I mean, it's totally stained on the inside. It's got propolis all over it, chunks of wax attached in various places. This is a really good box to catch bees in. So that's a third factor. The fourth factor is your swarm lure, which is what I brought this for. So this is just a basic Ziploc bag. And again, I, I like to, uh, my preference is to show people how to do it the cheap and easy way because it works and it's cheap and easy. So this is just a piece of paper towel. It's in a Ziploc bag. What you're gonna do is take um, some lemongrass oil, which you can get from all sorts of different places, especially here in Oregon where there's plenty of uh, uh, naturopathic stores and things. I bought this on Amazon just because it was a whole bottle for a couple of bucks and they shipped it right to my house. So this is really good stuff. Um, what happens is, the reason why this works, 
is because this is, a, is basically essential oil of lemongrass. And so the bee's location pheromone is, is the, the pheromone itself is called nasonoph pheromone, however you want to pronounce that. And one of the main ingredients, chemically, the main ingredients is a chemical called citrol, which smells like lemon. And this is like 75% citrol. So it's got one of the main chemical constituents is the same as what the bees naturally produce. So you would take your little bag here, you're going to drop, say, five to ten drops, not much, five to ten drops on the paper towel, and you're going to close the bag back up, right? If the bag is open, all that oil is going to evaporate out of there a lot quicker, it's going to be too strong, and the bees might avoid it for that reason. But with the bag closed, the oil will slowly diffuse through the plastic, and that will allow it to release, and then the bees will... Uh, scout bees will come and visit this hive and they'll see that it's got the right smell and it's got comb in it and it smells like bees and it smells like lemongrass. So there smells like lemon, it smells like their location pheromone and so that's going to be a huge plus when that bee goes back to the swarm and tries to convince the swarm to come to this hive. And also that smell uh, attracts more bees from that swarm and the more bees that can go back because bees are basically democratic they're going to go back and convince the swarm to come to this box and that's what we want them to do where's the opening in the in your swarm box in this one it would just be the corner oh okay but if you were to say build a wooden box if i was building a new one a little hole somewhere that you can plug up in this um I, do, I have built some 10 frame, I call them 10 frame nukes. It's a 10 frame box with a bottom all the way attached. Yeah. And it's got a hole in the front. Right. Um, but because I built it, I didn't put these type of handles on it. Uh -huh. if, you, if you put a hole, you could put a hole here, you could put a hole here. Yeah. Uh, if you don't want to put a hole in the box, you could put a hole in the lid, in the bottom. And if you want to, say you put a hole there for the bees to all go in, and they go in, and you want to take it somewhere, like put it in your car or whatever, you have some kind of like screen that you just tape a screen over the hole? The quickest way is to tape a screen. Well, it might not be quick. You could tape a screen or you could staple a screen. Staple it, yeah. Okay. I have on those boxes that, is, that I was just talking about, yeah. I have what's called disc entrances. Yeah. They're a piece those. of metal about four inches across right. and one side has a hole and one side has screen and the yeah. other side has a queen excluder. And so those are really useful those for a nice. permanent installation. Yeah. And they only cost like two and a half dollars each. Uh -huh. What are they called again? Disc entrance. Disc. Then the, you can change the entrance around. Exactly. Uh -huh. And so when you're ready to move it, you just switch it around to it on the screen side. Yeah. And people use those on their hives too. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're really good for nukes. I have them a lot on my nukes so that I can, if I need to take a hive somewhere, I just flip it over right. and haul the hive off. On, a, on one like this, which I will be using this next year because it's cheap. So I only have 10 of those other ones with the, with the disc entrances built on. So with this one, when I put it together, this next year I'll have it like this and then I will just keep some window screen with me and the lid will be screwed on always use screws never use nails because if these are set up somewhere in a tree where they might be dangling or um, they might get wet and then dry out and then get wet and then dry out the nails will work their way loose and they're just not a good idea so always use screws so next year when I use this I'll get some window screen and I will just mm -hmm staple some window screen over this when I'm ready to move it. Mm -hmm. So back to lures real quick. Uh, another homemade piece of lure that you can use is if you take um, dead queens. So if you've had to say you had a hive that had a really mean queen and you had to kill the queen or you um, one that I've done is if you split a hive and they make their own queens, mm -hmm. uh, a large number of the virgin queens are going to be killed by the first queen that hatches out. And they will be dumped on the front step because they're a lot bigger than workers and the, the workers that are hauling them out can't fly off with them. So they'll be dumped on the front step. You can take those, put them in a jar of alcohol, and the alcohol will cause the queen's pheromones to be... Mm. 
taken out of the body. Mm -hmm. And so you can dip a, a Q-tip in that and put that in here as well. Rubbing alcohol. Amazing. Um, I don't think the specific alcohol matters because it's all going to evaporate. Mm -hmm. I've used isopropyl alcohol. Mm -hmm. And um, then you just keep it around for a while? Yeah, so I have a, a jar, a little pint jar, that I put all my dead queens into. Oh, interesting. Huh. So if I have a hive that dies and I'm able to find the queen, mm -hmm. or if I have a mean hive or a sick hive that I need yeah. to kill the queen, I you know, I'd pinch her and put her in my pocket, and then take it home and stick it in the jar, and then use that as swarm lure later. You think it works better than the lemon grass? Or, um, you know? I myself haven't noticed a huge difference, mm -hmm. but Michael Bush says it works better. So, okay. Okay. I've also used these. You use both? You can use both. You can use all of the above. <laughs> yeah. Oh. The, more the, better, the more the better. The more factors. Remember, the more factors you have working for you, the better, because they, they help each other. So this is swarm lure from Man Lake. You can buy these. They cost about two fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought twenty five of these last year. I didn't end up using them all, so I have a couple more for next year. They have to be kept in the freezer. Um, if you're not using them, they last one season. And so what will happen is if this is in the hive, the bees will come in there. Well, let me show you what's in it. Don't open it. It says don't open it normally. You don't need to, but it doesn't matter. So it's just two little vials of stuff. The smell's gone. But normally they would smell like lemon. But that's their proprietary mixture of chemicals for their swarm lure. And they do work pretty well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they have more research and development in it than I do with the uh, lemongrass oil. Yeah, but it's like people have been using lemongrass it's, oil for a long time. It's a pheromone lure. I'm not sure pheromone, what, yeah. what they use in it. It's probably got lemongrass oil in it. It's probably got some other things as well. I don't know. They don't tell you what it is. Really? They don't tell you what it is? No, because it's not edible. They only have to tell you if you eat it. Hmm. Or if you put it on yourself. It. <laughs> yeah, so since you're not supposed to open the envelope, yeah. they don't have to tell you what's in it. <laughs> so those work pretty well. Uh, they're and, available and from... like how high you put it? Isn't that another Yes, factor? that's another important factor. You want it... Um, how high you put it isn't a huge factor. The bees aren't going to go for something that's probably not that's sitting on the ground. They're not going to go for that. Uh, and if it's up somewhere where it swings around a lot, where it's in constant motion, they're not going to go for that either. So the best place to put it is out of the reach of people on the side of a tree. Preferably teenagers because those are the sort of people that tend to mess with them. Um, it's also a good idea coincidentally, to stencil your contact information on the side. You say like, this is a swarm trap. If it contains bees, call this number or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or you, you number them. If different people do different land. ways. Yeah. Yes, and if it's not on your land, you want your, con your contact information on there. If it's on public land, I mean, the chances of it getting spotted if you've hidden it well enough are small. But if it's on someone else's land that you know, you want to, to develop a relationship with that person so that they'll call you when they see bees. And you can also sell it as a way to keep swarms from moving into their house or their buildings or things like that. Mm -hmm. Because if a swarm moves into a house, into a wall cavity or an eave or, or a floor cavity or something, they'll have to be removed and that costs money. So you can sell that as a preventative measure kind of like a mousetrap or something. Well, I don't know if mousetrap is a good idea. <laughs> still might move into some Well, else. yes. There's still a possibility of moving it in there, but since you're designing a really good swarm trap, mm -hmm. the chances are the bees will go into your trap rather than into their house. And that's what we're trying to go so for. So I've seen pictures of people like mounting them to trees. Is that necessary? Uh, it's not necessary, but it is good it? practice. I've used these. Now, I need to redesign it because this is not big enough for a full-size hive. This is meant for a nuke, five-frame nuke that's plywood 
which is much thinner than this wood and much lighter all around. So what I would do is I would take this and I would screw it to the side, two screws here and here, and then I would take this up with a ladder and I'd put it up on a tree and I would screw through this hole here and it would be stuck to the tree and then I could watch it, I could drive by, I could see bees in it or not. Um, a better way with boxes like this, I've read, is to use like a, a 1x4 or a 1x6 and to make this a little longer so that when you attach this screw up here, you have structurally everything's going to hold together. Remember, screws only, no nails. And then you can also, because a 1x6 is so wide, you can then bungee around the tree to hold it in place. You can bungee this to the tree. You can use um, cargo straps. You want it attached there so that it preferably doesn't move as much as possible. It's okay if it moves a little bit, but keep it from moving as much as possible. So we've got our um, empty frames. My friend in Indiana likes to use uh, empty frames, so these would work pretty well. They're, they're kind of, this has had the, the wax removed, but there's still some chunks of it sitting around, so the bees are gonna smell that, that'll be good. This is a foundationless frame. It's got a uh, comb guide there. Um, empty comb is good. I would use probably, for me, I would use foundation because um, this hive is not likely to be set up perfectly level. And if the hive is not perfectly level and the bees build foundationless comb, then the comb will be as vertical as the hive is. Mm -hmm. So if the hive's not vertical, you're going to get slightly curved comb. And if you don't get to it quickly enough right. and they'll fix build. it, they'll yeah. build it that way, and then you'll have kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. Although, as you saw, mm -hmm. um, when I got those boxes where the bees have built willy-nilly all over it, yeah. as long as you have some way of attaching pieces of that mm -hmm. to the top bars, right. Things that we made work. Yeah, it could be an extra <coughs> really. Right. And the idea is, if the sooner you get it before it starts building, right, the better. Yeah. Because if it's if it hasn't built anything, you can just shake them in mm -hmm. to a top bar hive. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's how I've done it with swarms and top bars. Yes, so there is. Them. There is the factor that if you shake them too much too soon, they might abscond or they might just leave. Mm -hmm. there's so a, there's a little <coughs> thing you can do with a top bar hive. You cut out a piece of plastic queen excluder. Yes, staple you can. Staple it to the entrance. That's one way you can block the queen in. If she can't leave, then the hive won't swarm. Right. The other thing is if you let them live in the, the swarm catch box for long enough so that they build, so that they start rearing brood, they won't leave their, they won't not leave the brood, but the chances of them leaving the brood is very right. small. Right, yeah. I mean, if you mess and them up real bad, they will leave. Yes. Brood combs back into the hive. Yes, and for those carpenters among us, one of the things you can do is build what's called swarm catch frames, where you take a, f basically take the design of a frame and you split it in half, and each half has wires on it, and then on the bottom you put two little hinges, and so basically the whole thing will open up, and you lay your comb in there, you close it back up, and you put it in the hive. Hmm? And the reason for that is what? It's just a really easy way to put loose comb into frames. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. But you have to make the frames yourself. Nobody, nobody sells yeah. those. Right. My favorite method is just to use an empty frame with no wire and rubber bands. Uh, deep frames don't work very well because a lot of the comb that you're going to get is not tall enough to, to take up the whole frame, so medium frames work well because they're only like this tall. And so a smaller chunk of comb you can get in there and, and, and secured with rubber bands. 
um, without it falling, without it wanting to, to bend over or fall apart. You're talking about the old comb too. Yes, if I'm if I'm yeah. cutting out cutting out a hive or a swarm that has right. settled in a box or somewhere that doesn't have frames or something like that. Uh-huh. Cardboard box like that guy was doing. Do people catch swarms in cardboard boxes much? I've oh. known one guy who did yeah. it. Well, yeah. <laughs> we saw them, but Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and that's I mean, he's, what he's doing is going out and actually catching swarms. I've never heard of anybody having a swarm settle in a cardboard box. Oh, I see. So he would fi- find them. Yeah. Yeah. Sounded like he was getting phone calls from people, and then he would take cardboard boxes out and shake the bees into the box and bring them back and poke a hole in it, and then oh, uh-huh. they would most of the time stay, which was their mistake. He says he still <laughs> owes me two. Well, if he owes you, I'm then... I'm going to take him up on him. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, free... He's going to get him quick, though. Free bees. Yeah. yeah. Well, they weren't free, but they're bees that are owed to you. <laughs> well, one's already paid for. Yeah, one's already paid for. <laughs> That's good. And then when we get to the lid, the lid's just another piece of wood. doesn't matter at all. And screw it down. And that's your basic swarm trap. So it's probably a, it's a great idea to find like old old hives that beekeepers are yes. getting rid of. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Those make the best swarm traps. Is old used boxes. So when I started out, I went up to my great uncle's place up on Forest Creek, and he had bees that he was kind of tapering off. He only had he was down to like five hives. I think at one point he had sixty or something. And so I paid him, I think I paid him like $50 for 13 boxes. You, They were all used boxes and, and most of them are junk, but that was how I got started, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we should put it out on Craigslist maybe, see if we can find them. Yeah. If you can find a good deal, great. Unfortunately, a lot of people think they can get money out of stuff. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> you know, Grandpa left me these old bee boxes. These must be worth money. Yeah. <laughs> and so you want to avoid those kind of people. And the other problem is with swarms, especially people think they're valuable. And so they want to sell them to you. Don't pay for swarms. Don't pay for bees. You can get them, well, can get them for actually, free and there's more I that are available. I pay somebody for some of her swarms. She charges $50, but $50 for her swarms. Well, that's they a different situation. Cats. Yeah. When I say don't pay for bees, I'm mostly talking to people that don't yet have bees. Right. You have bees and you do all sorts of fun things already. Yeah. So yeah. Got it. Yeah. if you want to go that route, that's great. You're not, you're not the person who's going to be losing all of their bees this winter, their first right, year. Right, right. You, you've, you're a longtime beekeeper. Um, you're not going to be discouraged if, if your bees die. But the, the, mo- the people that I'm mostly talking to are the people who are, who are in their first year yeah. or maybe second year, and they're really concerned about losing their bees. Yeah. To those people, I say, don't buy bees. That's good. Yeah. That's a good idea. Any more questions? So once you put this box in a tree secured, mm-hmm. um, like what time of year would you, like what month would you do that? Oh, there's wax all splattered on the front of there, isn't there? Um, you want to do that. It's going to be different in in different places around here. You're up in the mountains a little bit, though, so it might be a little later. Um, definitely, you want to have them out at least a week before the first reported swarm in your area. Uh, around here, we get a lot of swarms in April and May, so... If you could have them out, yeah. Hmm? go for April. Yeah, go for April. Yeah. Go for March, because it's not going to hurt right. to have them out a little early. Okay. Um, and it's not going to it's not going to hurt to have them out late. I've my my friend in uh, in Indiana. He keeps his out all year, because then he can catch swarms that are secondary swarms. Remember, the first swarm is your prime swarm. Mm-hmm. The earliest swarms are going to be the most healthy hives. Mm-hmm. But uh, Later swarms can be good as well. They're not going to be as big, right. and they may not. A really good early prime swarm can even produce honey in the first year. A later swarm is probably not going to do that. 
and a very late swarm might not even survive the winter. But any swarm, yeah, they're free, number one. Yeah. Um, but any swarm can draw comb quickly, more quickly than a, an established hive. And so even if you catch a swarm, you know, in August or something, and it doesn't survive the winter, chances are it's going to build some comb, and you can you can then use that as swarm traps for next year, or drawing comb for your supers, or for your top bar hive, or whatever. That That's always a resource that you can use, or you can use that freshly drawn comb, which is going to be nice and white, and you can trade that out for some old, ratty black comb, which then you can use for swarm traps. <laughs>